All right, good afternoon. <laughs> Did just recognize the music went down. So um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's, it's really special for me to be here because about three years ago is when I was actually sitting uh, where you're at today, uh, both literally and figuratively. So a little bit about myself before we get started. I'm gonna share with you my own cloud journey. Uh, so I spent uh, 25 years in the US Navy uh, doing a lot of you know your traditional management. So I, I was the operations officer for the Navy Networks and Telecommunications in, in um, uh, Europe. I was uh, the Navy CIO in Japan and I was the lead for cybersecurity for all of Asia. So in those roles, I uh, manage your traditional uh, networks and data centers. Um, and so that's the kind of the world I came from. Uh, when I left the Navy a few years ago, I came, actually came here to the city of Washington, DC, where I was the Deputy Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO, for the city, with a strategic focus on governance, risk, and compliance. And in that role, um, you know, as I started looking about how we were going to meet compliance across all the different city agencies, so we had FERPA for the schools, CEGIS for the police department, um, FTI for, uh, you know, for the federal tax information as far as for um, our social services, trying to figure out how we were going to uh, manage all that on-prem, the city was starting to move to the cloud. So in DC, uh, we had the DC Healthcare Exchange, which was our implementation of Obamacare, and it was actually going into AWS. Now, coming from that very traditional background, um, I was absolutely terrified of the cloud. I was completely against it. I was like, nope, not going to happen, not going to support it. I'm going to lose my visibility. I'm going to lose my control. I don't know where my data is at. And how am I going to maintain all this compliance that I have to meet for the entire uh, city? And so, uh, I, but you know, trying to figure out, okay, well, how we're going to do this. The one thing I did was instead of just saying no right off the bat, even though I was telling myself no, I tasked my staff and I tasked myself to start looking at the cloud, start doing some research. Let's before we start saying no, let's get some data behind it. Let's try to figure out, okay, what does, what is it, what is it not? And so we started learning about the cloud and trying to, you know, take some time. We started figuring some things out. So the first thing is I, I gave a terrible task to my staff. I tasked my staff to look at how we do things now and try to figure out how we can do the same things the same way in the cloud, right? So right off the bat, that was terrible because I handcuffed my staff to, to how we have always done things. And when you start to look at um, emerging technologies and, and innovative new ways of th doing things, you have to be open to, to doing things differently, right? And so, now, fortunately, it didn't take us long to actually figure out that, yes, we could achieve the same security in the cloud using doing a lot of the same things. We could scan our systems, we could patch our systems, we could implement firewall rules. So a lot of that really didn't change. But as we started really learning more and more the cloud, started getting more comfortable with it, we started realizing there were some other aspects of the cloud that we really weren't counting on initially. So what it did is it started highlighting some challenges um, in our on-prem environment that we've just gotten used to over the years, really over decades. And I think everybody has this type of ex uh, example in their life where you know things aren't as good as they need to be, but you also realize there's not a lot you can do about it, so you do the best you can with what you've got, right? And after a while, it just becomes the new norm. And so that kind of happened with us um, in an on-prem environment. And as we started looking at the cloud and we started seeing all the things, all the advantages that we were able uh, to achieve in the cloud, we started realizing um, the things that we have come to uh, accept in an on-prem environment um, that we really should never have, but it was just the best we could do. And so these um, challenges in on-prem environment was a lack of visibility, a lack of resiliency, a defense and uh, depth challenges, and a lack of automation, all right? So there's this paradigm that when you physically can, can touch your servers and your, and your racks and you're going go to your data centers, that you have visibility, right? You, have, you, you physically own everything, so how could you not have visibility, right? Um, but in today's world, things are changing as we, virtualize, we go to virtualization. So before, if you had 10 servers in a rack, and you can go up there and physically touch your 10 servers, you knew there were going to be 10 servers on the network. In today's world, those 10 physical servers could have 10 logical servers or virtual servers on each. So there could be up to 100 virtual servers on the network. But how many should be on the network? Is it 87? Is it 42? In addition, we still have uh, physical servers out there, physical assets. So I've been in operating environments where we had 
two different hypervisor platforms. And so we try to figure out, well, what do we actually have on the network? What's our inventory of the network? And you say, okay, well, we'd have these two different hypervisor platforms. We just take the inventory from both and add them together. Well, it's not so easy, right? Because in large enterprises, whether it be the city or the military or a large corporation, lots of times you still have physical servers out in data closets somewhere, right? Or you have a server under a developer's desk somewhere, all right? And so really trying to get that, that inventory becomes challenging. Then you start calculating in the network segmentation that exists out there. Um, the fact that endpoints and the endpoint agents don't always report up. Log aggregation, you start realizing that you don't really have the visibility in an on-prem environment that you really need, right? And that's highlighted a lot. So if you look at the CIS top 20 controls, one and two are all about inventory. Inventory of your hardware and inventory of your software. They are so critical because you can't do anything else within security if you don't know it exists. Right? And so we started realizing that you know, the visibility we had wasn't good enough. I'll highlight that a little bit more later. A lack of resiliency, especially in a government organization. The government typically does not fund programs um, that uh, will have your application living in multiple data centers or multiple server stacks. Right? The government typically funds just enough money to get the, the, the application up and running on a single server or on a single server stack and in one data center. So when you start looking at whether it's the military or, or state or city government or even mission critical for a co corporation, lots of times that mission critical application is only living in one place, right? Which means that you don't have resiliency. If something fails, then you're, that, that part of your mission is now um, at risk. We also have defense and depth challenges. We've been talking about defense and depth for decades. It's actually kind of become a kind of a bad concept, you know, that people stay away from. And the reality is not because it's a bad concept, it's just because of the fact that we've never really truly implemented defense in depth. And then the last piece of a low degree of automation. So in an on-prem environment, when you have a, a Cisco um, uh, uh, router and a Palo Alto firewall and McAfee endpoint protection, you have Windows servers and Linux servers, how do you automate operations across all those different platforms. They're all great platforms, right? They all have great capabilities, but especially in security, right? When your security operations and those processes span multiple platforms, how do you truly automate security operations across all of those platforms? And when it comes to security, to try to keep up with all this, the cyber crime and the nation state actors and everything that's going on, how do you keep up with all of that, when nobody seems to have enough resources, human resources and, and tools, you've got to be able to automate. So these challenges in on-prem are what we actually found to be benefits when we started looking at the cloud and AWS. So going a little bit more into visibility, I can't tell you the number of times that uh, a server would pop up out of the blue, right? Had some old operating system on it or had been patched in a while or the sysadmin that one sysadmin that was assigned to that left, right? And then now we're trying to figure out how to get back into that server. Happens probably once a year, once every, or twice a year, right? It was always a challenge. And then of course we're trying to figure out, well, how did we lose visibility? How did we, how did we lose sight of this server? And then how do we get it back up online and how do we prevent something like this from happening again? So we start looking into AWS. The first thing we started looking into is the means of which obtain information, right? Or visibility. In a traditional environment, when you want to know about your virtual servers, you go into the hypervisor and you can look at what virtual servers you have. On the network, you're going into your, your, a network, right, um, tools. And so we have all these different tools for all these different disparate technology platforms, but nothing that really, con really brings them all together. And where we do have them where it brings them in together, like a SIM, right, we still know that there's, again, it's not getting all of the information from all the assets. So in AWS, the first thing we start with is the console. So on the console, this is where you would be able to log in and you can now see all of your assets within AWS. It no longer matters whether server's turned on or off. It doesn't matter what network segment it's on. It doesn't matter what endpoint or if the endpoint agent is working. You can see all of your servers that you have up and running inside AWS, period, stop, right? But it also allows you to see more of what's going on within your environment. It allows you to see the data that you have, the databases, the applications, um, other things that you've got going on in your environment that you would have to go to some other tool for in an on-prem environment. 
You have the command line interface described, so you can query the services that you're using to get information about the service and, and how you're using it and the assets you have in it. But the most important piece is the APIs. You are not going to be able to scale for security um, and management um, if, you don't, if you're not using APIs. Right? So everything inside of AWS is done via an API. Whether you go to the console and click a link, whether you submit a command line interface command, everything gets converted to an API. And so being able to use the APIs is how you're going to be able to scale and integrate with other applications or tools such as Splunk. Then we have the, the use of resource tags. So in an on-prem environment, oftentimes we name the server something that kind of gives us a clue of what its purpose is, right? So if you have a Microsoft Exchange server for email, you might name it EXCH01. So now when you're looking at your inventory, you kind of know that this is an Exchange server. Or it might have an application name to it. Well, now you can have these resource tags, and you can have multiple resource tags um, on your assets, right? So if you have a particular compliance requirement, such as PCI, Every asset that must be PCI compliant can now be tagged PCI. This is not just servers, but your data, your database is everything else. Or it could be tagged for a program of record. So if you have a particular program name or a funding line, it can have multiple tags. So this gives you more context into your visibility. So as you run these queries, you're able to get that information a little bit better and to have that context into what are the resources that you have and what the purposes are. Okay. And then from there, you can bring everything into your business intelligence tools, right? So now you're, at, you're bringing everything, all that data into the visibility up to an actual knowledge platform to be able to make decisions based off of that. So these are the means of which obtain visibility. I'm going to go into a couple of the security services that provide the visibility. So the first is AWS CloudTrail. Everything, like I said, within AWS is done via an API. CloudTrail uh, logs all the API actions within your environment. So it logs the, the who interacted, whether it was a service of service, a user, what was done, when, where, everything about that transaction. So it's a, it tracks all the activity within your environment. Okay. Now you can say, well, that's not much different than what I've got now, right? But what I just talked about a few minutes ago, in an on-prem environment, you have all these different disparate technology platforms. They all have different schemas for their logs, right? So how they're formatted are differently. The way the, the names, the, the column names are different. Um, hopefully they're not, but oftentimes you have different timing sources for them, right? We already talked about how, for whatever reason, the logs don't always get to the central location. They may not always make it to the SIM or the log aggregator. So now you have this challenge where, um, in an on-prem environment, you really need to have all the logs, but you know you don't. For whatever reason, you don't always have all the logs. In AWS, we have this um, homogenous infrastructure environment where all the, the schemas and everything matches and all the timing sources match. So now you're able to correlate actions across all the different types of technology platforms within AWS, whether you're looking at network activity, um, the API activity, what's happening on a server or application. Okay. Moving on to Amazon VPC, the VPC is your virtual private cloud. This is the security boundary around your application. The flow logs are all the network traffic coming in and out. So now you have logs of all the activity inside of your environment, and now you have all the network traffic coming in and out. Amazon CloudWatch is kind of like a cloud SIM. I hate to say that because your typical on-prem SIMs are actually very robust and powerful. Um, but what CloudWatch does is it brings the logs from um, CloudTrail and your flow logs in, and it'll create events and alerts on those. So what's really important about CloudWatch is the fact that this establishes the foundation for you to start automating later on, okay, by having that central repository, okay? Your logs can be uh, digitally signed for uh, integrity and encrypted for confidentiality, all right? There's also, um, between CloudWatch and um, Systems Management Server, there's an agent that you can actually install on your OSs to get the logs from your OSs and your applications and ingest them in. So now you have the whole stack, not just the AWS infrastructure logs, but your OS and above application logs as well. Uh, moving on to our AWS app web application firewall. So now this gives you that visibility into what's being denied and what's being allowed into your environment, okay? Uh, it's a pretty good WAF. It provides your, your protections against cross-site scripting and SQL Server injections. Um, it's not as robust as some of our partner solutions from, say, F5 or Imperva, um, but it's a, it's a pretty good WAF. 
And then um, on the bottom left, we have Amazon Inspector, which is our vulnerability scanning tool. So it's kind of like your Nessus or Nexpos. So it scans your OSs and is looking for those vulnerabilities. All right, so in those first five, other than what I kind of talked about uh, by some of the benefits you gain for um, kind of reliability and consistency of the logs, is not too much different than what you see in your on-prem environment as far as core capabilities, right? But things start changing now uh, from there. So uh, an add-on we had for Amazon Inspector last year is the ability to determine if an asset of, of an EC2 instance is accessible to the public internet. All right, so think of your on-prem environment. If somebody makes a mistake at the perimeter security, and for some reason um, they've allowed access to, from the public internet to a core database server, how do you know that? How do you know that somebody misconfigured a firewall or that there's a problem um, with the perimeter security and you have a sensitive um, asset that's exposed to the public internet, right? Chances are you may not see that until it's too late, okay? Amazon Inspector, with the feature for network availability, if you can run that query, it will tell you those um, servers or assets that are exposed to the public internet. So then you can go and correct that, that misconfiguration or just make sure that it's consistent with the, those servers that should be exposed. Then we take it to the next level, trusted advisor. If you want to, to compare how you've implemented a technology platform in an on-prem environment with best practices, you're typically going to download the best practice guide right, from the vendor's website, and you're gonna go there line by line and kind of try to do that comparison, right? Very manual intensive process, right? Most people don't do it, um, other than maybe at the first install. Um, and so you start, you, you can very easily become out of um, compliance, I'm gonna say compliance, but out of alignment with best practices. With Trusted Advisor, it's an automated service that's always looking at your environment, and it will alert you when um, you are not following a, an AWS best practice. Okay, so this goes along for security. If you have an S3 bucket, and S3 is our simple storage service, or object storage, if you have an S3 bucket exposed to the public internet, it will let you know that. Now by default, S3 buckets, when you create one, they are not open to the public internet, okay, by default. You have to go through a lot of clicks and acknowledgements, or a CLI in order to expose one, but if you have, it'll let you know that. If you're not using multi-factor authentication for your root account, it will let you know that. So now you have this, this service that's constantly running and it will alert you as soon as it detects that you are not following a security best practice, okay? It also looks at things like uh, for cost um, efficiencies and performance. So if you're using a general compute instance uh, for uh, say a genomics machine learning algorithm and it's taking two weeks to run that, it can detect that and make the recommendation to you. If you shift from a general compute instance to a GPU instance, you might be able to take that down from a two week runtime to a two day runtime. And even though the GPU instance costs more to run, because you shorten the period of time, you still possibly could save money on that, okay? And the, th the third thing it does, it also looks at those cost savings, right? So one of the challenges uh, initial cus customers who are initially moving to AWS have is that they may over-provision the servers, right, what they need. Uh, a lot of times in an on-prem environment, kind of going back to that visibility, they don't always know exactly what they're using or what they need or their peak times or peak performance requirements. And so what happens is to kind of give them some, some safe zone, a little buffer space, they will over-provision into AWS. Right, so they'll stand up an EC2 instance that's a little larger, a little bit more v CPUs, a little bit more RAM that's required. And so over time, Trusted Advisor will see how you're using that server. It'll monitor it over time, the peak performances, and it'll start giving you recommendations that if you go from this larger compute instance type to a medium compute instance type, you can start saving some money there. Okay, so this is a really uh, nice service that's free that allows you to start implementing those best practices, right? And that's really only achievable from this homogenous um, infrastructure that we have. We have Amazon Guard Duty in the middle. I'm not gonna talk about that just yet. I'm gonna go in that more later. Um, but just for now, just understand it is our intelligent threat detection service. Okay, when you turn it on, it's typically look, it's, well, it's constantly looking at your environment and it's looking for the, the threats and the activity that's going on in your environment of, for malicious behavior. Um, it is designed to uh, cost no more, well, I mean, on average, than 1% of your total AWS spend. So when you start looking at the capabilities for guard duty and for threat detection at 1% of your spin, that's pretty phenomenal. Moving to Amazon Macy. Amazon Macy 
it has, is a service that really looks at your data and it has two core capabilities. So the first is kind of like a data loss prevention or DLP service. It's not quite how we typically look at it, right? A DLP typically sits at your perimeter and it's looking at data that's leaving your network, right? And it'll either block it or it'll alert you if something like social security numbers or, or credit card numbers try to leave your uh, network. What Macy does, it scours your S3 storage and it finds where the sensitive data is before it's ever accessed. Okay, so if you look at if you look at you, how you might use your share drives, um, on, your network share drives in your on-prem environment, typically there's a lot of data on there and they're very hard to manage. So there could be an Excel file with social security numbers on it from your HR department. Who knows what's on there, right? So now you're able to understand where the sensitive data is before it's ever accessed. So we have one customer that I was working with, they really wanted to clean up their shared drive. So they really weren't looking at a, a permanent solution, but what we did is we built a very secure um, uh, AWS environment that is not accessible to the public internet, was encrypted with MFA. And then what they did was they uploaded one shared drive at a time to run Macy. Now when Macy runs, it identifies the data, classifies the data, and it gives you a report of the data. If you have rules set up, where all credit card numbers must be encrypted and it finds a, a file with credit card numbers unencrypted, it'll either f encrypt the whole file, the object, or it'll encrypt the whole bucket, okay? But what they were doing is, without any rules, they were just getting that report, taking that report and going back and cleaning up their on-prem share drive. And then they would delete everything in S3 and bring the next share drive up, all right? Um, the second thing that Macy does is for the storage that you leave in AWS, it has some limited user behavior analytics or UBA capabilities. So over time, it learns how files are being accessed, okay? So if you do have that, that Excel file with a bunch of social security numbers in it, and it's typically accessed by two people in HR, Monday through Friday, normal working hours, and then all of a sudden at two o'clock in the morning over the weekend, it's being accessed you know, 500 times, it'll pick up on that anomaly whether it's from those same, one of those same two people or whether it's from somebody different, okay? So now you're starting to get some of that visibility into the, the behavior uh, that's happening within your environment and, and around your sensitive data, okay? And the last one here is AWS Artifact. Uh, so, so this is not really what I would consider a true IT service. It is a repository of all of our third-party audit reports, right? But this is how you gain visibility into the controls, the security controls that we have implemented in our infrastructure. Right, so you heard a lot of great stuff um, the last couple of days here about all the things we do and how we secure your environment and what you can do. But how do you how do you validate that what we say up here is true, right? So this is where you'll go into our AWS Artifact, pull those third-party audit reports, and you can see the controls that were assessed and how they were assessed, okay? And so this is how you're going to be able to um, determine whether or not we meet your requirements and then how you build on top of that. Speaking of AWS Artifact, so we comply with over 80 different international standards and frameworks uh, for compliance, okay? And so this is where uh, many of these you will pull those third-party audit reports from. All right, so we have, you know, for this particular group, we have the DOD SRG, the FedRAMP, PCI, uh, and so forth. Also um, is that uh, when the, U in the U.S. federal government, right, so the U.S. federal government's been mandated to um, implement this, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, and, but we also are seeing the CSF being adopted internationally by other governments. So Japan, Uruguay, and Israel have adopted the CSF at the national level. We're also seeing it really expand commercially. And so what, the one thing that we wanna highlight is we have a white paper um, that actually talks about how you can align to the NIST CSF within AWS. Okay. All right, so getting into resiliency. This was, to me, one of the greatest advantages, right? So one of my biggest concerns on the risk side was, you know, if we had a particular outage in the city that took down one of our data centers and there were critical applications in that data center that had to deal with, with safety services, you know, what would that, what would happen? What, you know, how would we be able to um, support those safety services if the data center was down or, or if a server was down? And so we started looking at, at the cloud and specifically AWS, we started identifying the ability to implement resiliency um, uh, within our applications, right? So when we start looking at security, right, we have the CIA triad, right? The confidentiality, the integrity, and availability. We have focused the majority of our time on the C and the I because the A is very expensive. It is very expensive 
and very complicated to implement true availability, right? So if you look at most on-prem environments, they typically do not have applications that are load balanced synchronously across multiple data centers, okay? And so as we started looking at that, this is, was a huge benefit for us. So to kind of get into that, you kind of have to understand how our infrastructure is set up. So we have 21 uh, region, regions, 66 availability zones, and 169 edge locations. And there's probably a good chance that somewhere in the last couple days that these numbers might have just changed on me. Um, the uh, numbers in the parentheses um, are the, represent the number of availability zones in each region. Okay, so the, one of the questions though is what is a region? And, and this is kind of a challenge in our industry because even though the cloud service providers all use the term region, what compromises a region is different between CSPs, okay? So for us, a uh, region is a metropolitan area that we, where we build our data centers, okay? A region is comprised of two or more availability zones the new standard is three availability zones, all right? An availability zone is a logical fault isolation zone, okay? And so this allows us to do maintenance without impacting the entire region. It also minimizes the scope of impact if, uh, if we have a service outage. And it also allows our customers to build for high availability uh, within the region uh, in these AZs. An AZ is comprised of at least one data center but there are typically many, many more, okay? We do not disclose the number of data centers or where their location are because for security purposes. Um, so while it's important to understand the difference between a data center and an AZ, when you start to architect, you're gonna actually kind of merge those because you cannot, deter, you're not, you cannot um, tell AWS what data center you want to use. You can only say what AZ you want to use, okay? Um, so our regions, when you put your data into an AWS region, it stays there, right? We do not copy, move, or back up your data to any other region for any reason, okay? The, um, all the links between the data centers, um, the, what we've got for bandwidth, we're able to achieve sub two millisecond um, latency between the data centers. So you can achieve synchronous data replication within a region. All right, so this is key for the high availability for an, an application to have synchronous data replication within the region. All, right. all of our data centers are physically separate facilities. All right, this is very important to understand, physically separate facilities. And then from there, they're kind of your standard multiple power, multiple ISP connections. But why is this important? It's important because some of our competitors, um, a region is a whole country where they might have two data centers on opposite ends of the country, okay? Or a region could be one data center. And so if they lose that one data center, they've lost the entire region, all services. That also means that in order to protect your data, they're backing up your data to another region that they may have, okay? So it's really important to understand what the differences are. In some cases, other CSPs might have two data centers, but it's data center one's on the first floor of the building, data center two's on the second floor of the building. Right? It still doesn't help if the building, something happens to the building, okay? So uh, it's really important to understand that. So moving on to what it looks like for you. So how can you architect for high availability and resiliency within your environment? So this is a representation of, say, of a, a typical um, three-tier web application. In, in this case, you actually have multiple server stacks uh, for load balancing. So you have the, your one data center. The firewall at the top is just a representation of your security boundary, whatever that may be, okay? You're gonna have a load balancer. This is typically a physical appliance. Hopefully you have at least two, um, but this is where you start starting to see the sign. So if you have one, if that load balancer fails, or in this case, if your data center fails or your perimeter security fails, you've lost everything. If you have two load balancers, um, especially in the government, we don't typically buy enough capacity. Uh, so if you lose one, you're probably gonna start having to throttle back, you're gonna start losing some, uh, start dropping some connections. In this case, uh, you have a load balancer in the top and you have from the web server down the app down to the database server. In this model, if the application server on either side crashes, all the traffic going down that side is now lost, right? All the traffic going down the other side is gonna be able to, to maintain and you're gonna be able to service those customers. Everything on the other side is now lost, okay? So you start seeing a lot of challenges in, in this type of environment. So within AWS, uh, you're going to um, select the region that you want to use. Uh, you're going to create your VPC, which again is that security boundary around your application. 
and you're going to select at least two availability zones. I highly recommend at least three. So anybody who's ever done any type of risk calculations, you understand the magic number of three, um, but at least two. And you're going to create your subnets, okay? And then you're going to add your elastic load balancers. Now, the load, elastic load balancing service is not a, a single appliance or two appliances for you, okay? It's a service running our, our global infrastructure. And with the cost of these, the services, you're now able to afford uh, uh, load balancing services uh, in between the tiers, right? So in this model, if we have an app server um, that crashes on one side, the load balancer will, will shift the load all to the other app server in the other data center, okay? And so now you don't have any type of impact with, uh, between any type of failure, okay? You also will add auto scaling group. So this was the next really big advantage of going to the cloud is now we can scale out. So it's very difficult to determine capacity requirements, right? Especially for a new application. You, you can do some studies, you can do some research, you can have an idea of what the demand is going to be, but you don't always truly know. So what happens is you either under provision and then have to go buy more later, or you over provision and you've wasted money, right? So we're gonna use an example of a, a university. So if you're a university and you have a course registration application, um, most of the year it's not really being used, right? Your, your admin staff is updating the course descriptions and the professors and the term dates, but most of the time it's not being used, right? But three times a year, you're gonna open up the, the registration season and thousands of students are gonna hit that server, that application, and you have to have the capacity to handle that. So in on-prem environment, you're spying these very large and expensive servers that are gonna sit there and be wasted most of the year. All right. So in this case, what you're going to do is you're going to have um, two small servers in each tier, okay, and, and that's just enough to keep the lights on, right? Just enough for the admin staff to go and do what they need to do within the application. All right. Then, as soon as you open up the, the registration season, the auto scaling group will see the load coming in. Now you can either schedule it, like you can have a particular date and time to automatically spin up some extra servers, kind of to ready to go, or you can base it off of usage require uh, usage that's coming in, uh, that's uh, coming on the the servers that you already got up. So as the demand increases, it'll start to to spin up new servers to take the load. As soon as course registration season is closed, it'll bring those servers down. Meanwhile, you've only paid for those servers that are up and operational at that time, okay? So, um, but what this also does is kind of going back here, this environment also is now a self-healing environment. So if that app server crashes, right, we don't care. If you're a sysadmin or you know any sysadmins, you know that sysadmins treat their servers like pets. They give them names, they feed them, they pet them, they pray to the server gods. If a server dies, they cry. It is a bad day, right? Now, because, well, they're gonna be spending hours trying to reconstitute that server, the bosses will be calling up yelling at them. Meanwhile, your customers, whether it be internal or external, can't get the job done, you know, they're not being serviced. Now, we don't care anymore. If that app server crashes for whatever reason, this, this architecture can kill it off right away, load balance everything to the other server, which is actually in another data center, and within a couple of minutes, bring a whole new server up and online and replace the first one, right? We do not care about an individual server anymore, right? Now, if you're from security and you wanna know what happened, instead of just killing that failed server, you can isolate it over and actually, uh, so they can do forensics on it. Or maybe you wanna isolate it and have your DevOps team take a look. Maybe it's some code that, you know, a patch or something that, that broke it. Um, but now you can start, um, but you're able to keep up an operational regardless of a server failure, okay? So this actually um, changes your risk model. Today, we have a reactive disaster recovery risk model. This allows you to shift to a proactive uh, resiliency risk model, right? Not that you're ever gonna get risk down to zero, but when you're able to address that risk uh, more in the beginning, right? Then it's better to have that in the beginning because who's ever done uh, a server restoration or a backup restoration, right? We all know it goes perfectly every time, right? And so now you know, we can minimize the likelihood of having, having to do that, right? So defense in depth, 
defense in depth is something we've been talking about for decades. This is the reality, right? We put layer upon layer upon layer at the perimeter and everything inside is soft and gooey. Typically when you walk into a data center, everything in the data center can talk to everything else within the data center. Right? When you're on an active directory domain, when you have domain credentials, you have access to the whole domain. Right? It doesn't matter whether or not there should be. Um, everything can kind of talk to each other. So I'm going to walk with you a little bit about what defense in depth could look like within AWS. All right, so I'm going to start at the perimeter, something a little bit com more common. Um, so we've already got the VPC. Okay? So again, the VPC by default has no public internet access. Right? So this architecture right now, that web server, nobody can actually get to it, okay? You're gonna add your access control list, so that's your stateless firewall capability around each subnet. You can connect um, this VPC to your private network, your on-prem network through a direct connect. So this extends your network into the VPC, okay? And only your VPC. So now this architecture allows this server, this um, application, to be accessible by anybody inside of your on-prem network, you know, if you've got the ACLs and everything set up, okay? Uh, you can add a VPN gateway, okay? So maybe it might be some mobile users and they need to get in, so they're gonna have a VPN gateway. If you need to have public internet access, you'll add an internet gateway, okay? So these are a little bit different because you're on-prem, you basically, you know, you're gonna have that connectivity and you gotta put a firewall in it and to start blocking things. Right? So things are different now, right? By default, you don't have any public internet access. You gotta start opening things up rather than start closing them. Um, by default, everybody gets free DDoS protection through Shield, okay? So this is something you're having to pay for right now on-prem. We do have Shield Advance for those customers who anticipate um, you know, extreme large DDoS attacks. It also comes with um, uh, an SLA for live human uh, response. We have our web application firewall, like I mentioned before. And then we have one of the largest partner ecosystems um, in the industry. So you can bring in whatever you have uh, that you're used to on-prem, okay? So this kind of provides that magical single pane of glass. So the, the say the firewall admin or the, the WAF admin can be sitting on-prem and manage the devices on-prem and in the cloud using the same interface. And then there's that Amazon guard duty that's looking within this environment. I'm gonna talk about more later. So now, by default, there is no communications between your applications anymore. There is no basic network connectivity between your applications. There's no Active Directory domain that connects them in this sense right here. They're, so they are completely isolated, right? So one of the challenges in an on-prem environment, and one of the reasons why phishing is so successful, is because our typical environment today is an open trust model, right? Once you get through the perimeter, everything inside is pretty much open and trusted, okay? And so that is why as soon as they get a phishing email in and somebody clicks it, it's able to lat move so easily throughout the environment, okay? This starts isolating your workloads on your data, okay? Now, if you need to, you can build in communication paths between your applications. So you can have application layer communications over the internet. You can have a private link, which is usually used for like microservices. Um, or you can have a core VPC peering, your, your core network connectivity between them. All right. But this is kind of, for me, where it really got good. All right, so we already have the ACLs on the subnets. Now we can add security groups around each tier. A security group is essentially the equivalency of a stateful firewall capability. Okay, so now we are building security between the tiers of the same application. So even in a data center where you might have some network segmentation or a couple of things that kind of protect the data center a little bit, um, within the application, you almost never really have any type of security within the application protecting the application from itself, right? And so, but it, the, re the reality is a web server should never be talking directly to a database server. If that's happening, the web server's been compromised or going straight after the data. Right? So you want to build in the security within, between the tiers of the same application. Also with security groups, remember as we talked about the servers spinning up to address the, the resource needs? By default, as new servers spin up, they cannot talk to each other. Again, one web server should never be talking to another web server. Right? It should only be talking up and down the stack. So now you have security around each tier of the application and even between the servers of the same tier. 
You can still put on whatever third-party um, endpoint protection you want on your, your EC2 instances. Um, you can still scan your EC2 instances, whether you use Inspector or if you already have Nessus or Nexpos, you can continue to use those or any other scanner that you use. Uh, we have Systems Manager. So Systems Manager maintains the inventory of your EC2 fleet and it uh, can push patches. So you can get that cyclic uh, patch scan, patch scan um, throughout your environment. I already talked about CloudTrail for its logging all the activity within your environment, uh, CloudWatch, and there's that guard duty again, right? So with this, you see that the perimeter security is, is kind of similar, right? But now we're starting to put some defenses uh, farther down the stack, right? You now have some protections between your applications between your workloads, between the tiers of the same application, and even between the servers of the same tier of the application, all right? So now, and what I, what I came to find out was, wow, this whole defense in depth thing that I kind of just pushed to the side, it was a great concept, it just, we just never got it done. We can actually get it done. And it didn't require buying a thousand firewalls to put in my data center. It didn't require hiring an army of firewall engineers, right? I could start getting this done throughout my environment. Um, well, actually, I don't know how that slide got changed. This is supposed to be automation. Um, first part of um, automation, remove humans from the data, right? Yes, there are a couple bad people out there, but I'm an optimist. I like to think that you know, pretty much almost everybody is a good person. It doesn't matter though, right? It doesn't matter how good your people are, the best intentions or the skills or the knowledge they have. Um, they are not as fast as automation. When it comes to security, you've got to automate. You are not going to be able to scale your operations and be able to respond to the cyber threats with people, right? The only way to do that is through automation, okay? And so the first step is remove humans from the data. The, for us, uh, for our customers, the best place to start was Amazon Guard Duty. So this is that intelligent threat detection service. So Guard Duty brings in threat intelligence from Proofpoint and CrowdStrike as well as threat intel that we develop for managing our global infrastructure, okay? The, um, it is now providing that context into what it's seeing. Everything in white is, are the uh, stateless or signature-based threats um, that it can detect, and everything in blue are your stateful or behavioral threats that it can detect. So everything from your CNC activity to your Bitcoin mining, um, you know, to your Tor activity. We had a uh, commercial customer that was running their Microsoft Exchange servers in AWS, okay? Now Exchange typically runs hot, high utilization, okay? And they had some IT folks that thought that they were gonna make some money off of this, and they installed, installed Bitcoin mining software on those Exchange servers, and, and it worked, right? It was kind of, the Exchange activity was covering that Bitcoin mining activity. As Soon as we released Guard Duty, that customer turned on Guard Duty, I think a month or so later, picked it up right away. Right, so now they saw this Bitcoin mining activity going on. They were able to clean it up within their environment because of all the logging. They knew exactly who did it, when they did it, and, and so forth, right? Um, so, but this is really important. Um, Guard Duty takes all your API logs, your um, VPC flow logs, and your DNS logs, and it's, this is what it's looking for within your environment. So one example I like to use for automation, it's actually a really simplistic um, example is as soon as you put a web server on the internet, it's being scanned. Every, you know, everybody from Google to add it to search engines, and in this particular audience, to nation states, right? People are scanning it. And there's different types of scans. Some are more malicious than others. So when Guard Duty picks up on a, on a scan, um, it'll alert you to, okay, this is a type of scan. This one's a little bit more malicious, but it also starts providing that threat intel context, right? It's coming from this IP address. This IP address is a known cyber criminal. Okay, it's done bad things on the internet elsewhere. It's coming from this country that we might have a little bit more of a concern from, or this ISP, okay? So now with that, that information, that's great. Now, if you have a, a SOC analyst, a security operations center security analyst, that's sitting there watching guard duty and it picks up on that alert, they can start taking action, all right? But what's the reality? The reality is there's so many logs and so many events happening um, and you don't have enough people, it might take a while before they actually pick, go back and find this one or pick it up and then do the research on it. So in order for this to happen, if it sees a cyber criminal doing a malicious scan on your server, it could be hours, days, weeks, or months before somebody actually finds it and does anything about it, okay? So now we wanna automate this. We're gonna 
the Amazon is, uh, Guard Duty is going to detect that type of scan with all the information. It's going to create a CloudWatch event. Okay, that CloudWatch event can trigger an AWS Lambda function. So Lambda is our serverless function service. So think of it as snippets of code uh, that are going to do very discrete functions okay, that are just waiting for something to trigger them. In this case, this um, event, this guard duty event, is going to trigger a Lambda function that you create, that it's going to take that IP address, and it's going to insert it into the web application firewall filtering rule. So now, very, very quickly from detection, you've now mitigated the threat, right? No human interaction required. Uh, you stopped it. So they, they're not able to, it's, it's so fast, they're not able to complete the scan. If for some reason they were able to detect a vulnerability in the very first couple seconds of the scan, they cannot go back and exploit that. Not only did it, does it protect it from that one server, it protects it from every server behind that, that WAF. Okay? Um, but it can do more than just one thing. Right? So you can add it to a next generation firewall rule or any type of partner solution. You can um, add that information to a communications um, channel. Okay? You can add it to your DevOps tools and processes. Okay, so one of the biggest challenges in the security operations area is when, when the SOC starts changing, making changes to your infrastructure to mitigate a threat, those changes are very rarely reflected back into the configuration change management database, right? So that always puts those two teams at odds, okay? So now, don't just automate the response. Automate the update of your configuration change management database. Make sure that that authoritative source stays authoritative. Okay. Uh, you can add it to any other type of AWS services or partner services, and it's really back through the APIs. Okay. So my big thing is always try to get security operations involved from the very beginning with any type of move to the cloud. We have customers that like to start with non-sensitive data like web applications, right? But because it's non-sensitive, they don't really bring in a security team. Or the security team is like, oh, yeah, that's public data. I don't really care about it, whatever. What happens, though, is customers start moving from the non-sensitive, and they start getting more and more sensitive. Next thing you know, they don't bring the security operations team until it's time for a mission-critical application. And then guess what happens? Security team didn't grow and learn and make that journey with the rest of the organization. So they get to the point where mission-critical, and they become the department of no. Right? So highly, highly recommend that the security team, and especially security operations, goes with the very first movement to the cloud. Even if it is a public website and it's just static public data, they need to, to start getting that experience early and even on the non-sensitive stuff of how they're going to monitor and how they're going to respond so that it, they grow with the rest of the organization. So my personal cloud journey was that, you know, from being terrified of the cloud, absolutely against it, to this is the best thing to slice bread. Um, you can achieve the same security and compliance objectives in the cloud as you do on-prem, and you actually have the, op the opportunity and the potential to achieve greater security and more confidence in your uh, compliance in the cloud than you can on-prem. On and so with that, I uh, appreciate your time this afternoon. I know it's the last one of, of, the, of the events, uh, so I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful day.